Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today, and welcome to another USAID Soybean Innovation Webinar. My name is Maggie Cornelius, and I will be moderating today's webinar. I am the Program Coordinator for SIL's Human Nutrition Research Area, which focuses on integrating soy's high-quality protein into the diets of undernourished regions. Today's webinar is entitled Complementary Food for Africa, New Products and Approaches for Improved Childhood Nutrition, and we'll be focusing on an investigation that the Soybean Innovation Lab conducted in Ghana on a new complementary feeding product called Comfa, made from soybean flour and orange flesh sweet potato. The results of the study are meant to be valuable to development practitioners and organizations in two ways. The first is to share data about the nutrition and the likelihood of children and their mothers to adopt a new form of complementary feeding called Comfa. This data can help development practitioners make an informed decision about the complementary food products to use in their early childhood nutrition programming, especially if they are looking for alternative products besides mainstream foods such as Weanimix and Seralac. Secondly, this study is meant to model for the development sector how to go about testing new products for early childhood nutrition programming prior to implementation and scaling. We will talk about the different variables to consider when evaluating complementary feeding products, as well as how to model a study. The attention is to communicate the importance of making evidence-based decisions to develop strategy for development efforts. The data generated by studies such as these can have far-reaching impacts on development interventions for early childhood nutrition. At the end of the webinar, the audience is encouraged to field its questions to all of today's presenters using the chat box in your GoToMeeting panel. For those who can't stay the whole time or who couldn't be in attendance today, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our website. We've also shared with you the report that SILS published um, from this study. We sent it to you yesterday prior to this webinar and we'll recirculate it after the webinar um, for you to read. As we share this information with you, it is SILS hope to share to start a discussion with practitioners about the challenges and needs they face in the development community. SIL intends to use this feedback to develop strategy for its future early childhood nutrition investigations. Today we'll be hearing from the principal investigators of the study, Dr. Francis Amaglo, Professor of Nutrition at the University for Development Studies in Tamale, Ghana, and Dr. Juan Andrade, Assistant Professor of Global Nutrition at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and Principal Investigator for the Soybean Innovation Lab's Human Nutrition Research Area. We also will be hearing from SIL's implementing partners in Ghana, Catholic Relief Services, who planned and executed this study in Ghana last year. Speaking on behalf of CRS will be Maoli Asigbi, Agriculture Program Manager, and Philip Atim, Agriculture Senior Program Officer. For those of you not familiar with SIL, we are a project funded by Feed the Future, the food security initiative of USAID. The mission of SIL is to provide researchers, extensionists, the private sector, NGOs, and funders operating across the entire value chain, the critical information needed for successful soybean development. Specifically, it looks at the role the soybean can play in reducing poverty and malnutrition, and it provides technical information to those who develop soybeans in South America, Africa, and Asia. SIL is divided into different research areas with the human nutrition research area focusing on how to expand the use of soybeans among diverse populations in low income settings. Our research and programming focuses on household enterprise, enterprise and institutional level efforts to improve nutrition using soy's high quality affordable protein. Now, um, our first speaker today is Dr. Francis Amaglo from the University of Development Studies. Um, but before um, we start with his presentation, throughout this webinar, we'll be doing some po polls for the attendees. 
so that we can learn more about the type of early childhood nutrition programming and foods that uh, you currently work with. So I'll launch a poll right now and you'll have a minute to respond to it and then we'll share the results with you. Then we'll move on to the presentation and uh, intermittently throughout this webinar, we'll launch a few other polls um, on, this, on similar topics. So I'm launching the first poll. And if you're having difficulty answering, um, you can send a question in via our chat panel. Okay, um, I'm going to close the poll now, and I'm going to share the responses. Can everyone see the responses? Yes. Great. Um, so we're, we're just interested in this because um, the mainstream complementary food products um, right now are made typically from maize, soy, and wheat. Um, but this product that we're discussing today includes orange flesh sweet potato as well as um, soy. And so we found that this develop, this creates a more nutritious product. Um, so Dr. Francis Amaglo um, will be speaking more about the nutrition and other benefits and other findings of COMFA from this study. Francis, are you able to speak now? Yeah, I am. Thank you. Great. Francis, feel free to start when you're ready. Yeah, I'm not getting this the slideshow. Okay. Do you see it now? Yeah, I see it now. Great. Okay, so good afternoon from Ghana, wherever you are, maybe good evening or good morning. So we here to talk about comfort, an orange flesh based complementary food. But before I proceed, we have to conceive this idea first. Where did they start? It started in Ghana. But we actualized it during my PhD studies in Massey University. So my supervisors are duly acknowledged. And now I'm working with SAIL to see how we can upscale it. But as the pool showed, I think what everybody uses for complementary food is maize. And in Africa, unfortunately, it's the white variety that we use. So, and even if you take the Codes Alimentarial Standards, the definition for complementary food is almost is biased towards made. But then there are some limitations which we'll discuss later. So to improve maize only complementary or cereal only complementary food, Uni itself came up with the addition of legume to improve it. Unfortunately, Though the protein and energy contents were improved, cereals and legumes are high in phytate. That limits micronutrient bioavailability. And also for the climatic conditions prevailing in Africa, where I am, they are suitable for aflatoxin contamination. 
thus we can say that the consumption of cereal-based complementary food could be associated with the high micronutrient deficiencies in Ghana and elsewhere under nutrition, stunting and underweight. White maize and legumes are also low in vitamin A. So if you look at the vitamin A status worldwide, my country, Ghana, is not doing very well because we are predominantly using white maize. Pass, please. So what is comfort? Comfort is basically orange flesh, sweet potato bait, complementary food. So if you look at it, in this study, we came up with three formulations of comfort. So the major ingredients for comfort is the OFSP, the soy, and then anchovies for some community. And then in addition, we also added moringa to it to improve the protein content of course being the supposed the miracle crop. So if you take a look at winning mix, winning mix is also based on maize, granite, and then soy. And then as the pool indicated, this is what is widely used. And in Ghana, the recipe is called winning mix, which was developed in 1991. So our comfort, the new one we are promoting, or we suggesting to everyone is, whatever maize is providing, orange flesh sweet potato can provide. So if I combine orange flesh sweet potato with soy, I can take the maize out, I can take the granite out, and then in that, in doing so, I'm invariably taking out ingredients that have high risk for aflatoxin contamination. And also the data collected on water use during the preparation. If you look, compare the one, the last one, which is the cereal-based complementary food, and then the sweet potato-based complementary food, the top three, you realize that about, we use about three times of the water for the winning maize compared to the comfort. So it tells you also that there's, there's an issue, actually there's a publication on it, that the addition using Winamax, there's a tendency of you having more, uh, an issue of what, and nutrient and energy thinning, because you tend to add more water because of the starch that is involved in it. But the sweet potato doesn't have that starch. The moment you hit sweet potato, the bitter amylase come into play and hydrolyze the starches down. So you don't use too much water. So from this slide, I, I hope we just keep the picture of comfort formulation down. Then as we talk about some nutritional benefit, you see, we don't need to add a lot. We are only looking at adding two or three ingredients compared to winning maize where you need to add about four ingredients and you have to buy sugar to sweeten it. In comfort, you don't need to buy sugar to sweeten it. So you can see that we're using too many ingredients when preparing the maize-based complementary food than the sweet potato-based complementary food. And the methods for preparation are all down there. And you can see we have to do more preparation for the winning maize than for comfort. Pass, please. Yeah. So this actually is a study we have published already where we did a comparison between winning mix and comfort. So the simple sugars up to the amount of starch will tell you why comfort would use less water compared to winning mix and why we don't need to add sugar to comfort. And this is important because at the house, the rural household level, we don't need to add sugar to sweeten our product for the children to eat. And it will need to cause reduction. And if you look at the vitamin A concentration, Conva is superior to Winamix. So we can't compare Winamix to anyway. And what we have to all be informed about is the Conva, we don't add any 
vitamin A supplement to it or fortificant. Let me use the right term to it. But this is what the endogenous vitamin A we're getting from the beta carotene. Of course, it has some form of ascorbic acid. Look at after cooking the porridge, you have 30 milligram per hundred gram. And we know ascorbic acid may influence the inhibitory effect of phytate, which is the next one. And then, but unfortunately, confa has a lot of polyphenols and it can be due to the color. And of course, we know sweet potato has a strong antioxidant property and polyphenols are related to it. But there are studies we need to conduct to find out if the polyphenols in sweet potato is inhibitory as in Syria, because studies have shown that there are differences. Next slide, please. So in our early childhood nutrition study, this is our contribution to energy and some nutrients of interest we highlighted. So if you take comfort, I'm talking about the calories, you realize that the OFSP contribute about 65% of energy and soil brings about 35% of the energy. If you go to protein, is the soil, soil, soil that helps us to get more protein than the OFSP. So I would not recommend any family to any family to give only orange flesh sweet potato to a child as a complementary food. But if you add soy to it, you improve. And if you add anchovies, you also improve upon it. And you can see that the anchovy contributes a portion of the protein because of the quantity we use. The moringa, though it's been healed a lot, doesn't produce, give a lot of protein. And this could be due to the proportion we use. If you use too much, the porridge will be green and the children will not accept it. Interestingly too is the iron content. If you look at the iron, is the soil being that bring a lot of iron to the composition. But if you consider the vitamin A, you realize that the sweet, the orange flesh sweet potato doesn't need any help, if I can like if I can loosely say that, to meet the vitamin A requirement. So this is a picture of what our various ingredients did for us. Next slide, please. Uh, this uh, one will give a detailed presentation of our findings from the study, but I'll present a few on overall acceptability. So you realize that there was all the mothers accepted to the same degree. The overall likeness for the formulations we investigated. So there's no difference between the confers and then the winnings in terms of acceptability. But let's remember that for the Winnie Mix, we added 400 grams of sugar to it, which is a lot, and it's a lot of money you put in there. But for the old comfort formulation, no sugar was added, but the lightning was the same. Next slide, please. And then we ask the question if the mothers will be willing to give the product to their children. Once again, the only thing that was minus is the moringa we added and the anchovy. We know the anchovies is a good source of protein and quality protein. But when you add it to the porridge, the mothers did not like it. But apart from that, comfort alone, compared to Winnie Mix alone, there were no differences in terms of the mothers willing to give the complementary food. And the comfort alone is the OFSP plus the soy plus a little bit of amount of oil. Next slide, please. So what conclusions can we make about comfort? Now I'll take home message. So we'll carefully go through it. So comfort is, is nutritious and it's safe alternative complementary food for children in rural Ghana and as well in Africa. It is safe because you don't need to worry about flactosin contamination. And comfort based on scientific data we have published elsewhere, 
will provide all the energy and also give significant amount of vitamin A and quality protein. I can say that the comfort is an excellent source of vitamin A because it means more than the 20% of the, the daily requirement. Comfort is naturally sweet, which is very good. So you don't need to add sugar to sweeten it. So in so doing, you also reduce the cost for porridge preparation in Africa. And as I said, OFSP and soil are less susceptible to aplactosin contamination compared to peanuts and then maize. So the, one of the safety issues about comfort is because of its low risk of being contaminated with aflatoxin. So in generally, comfort requires less water and fuel during preparation. And this may result in household savings, but we need more research to substantiate this finding. Next slide, please. So thank you very much. And I hope during the question time, we'll have some interesting discussions. Thank you, Francis. Um, and just a reminder to the audience, um, we will circulate the full report of the study to you after this webinar. And it's also available on our website right now. Before we move to the next presentation from Catholic Relief Services, I'm going to launch our second poll um, and you'll have a minute to respond. Okay, we have 10 seconds left in the poll, so I'll be closing it. I'm sharing the results of the poll. Um, and the reason we ask this question is that um, Soybean Innovation Lab is interested in uh, conducting further investigations about new complementary feeding products. Um, today we're talking about an acceptability and feasibility study that we conducted on a certain product, but there are other aspects um, that we need to investigate about products to ensure that um, a successful implementation will happen. So thank you for your feedback and when, when we go into the Q&A we can um, have time to discuss what other types of studies look like and the need for um, certain types of studies in the early childhood nutrition development space. Okay, now um, we're going to welcome Mauli Asigni and Philip Atim from Catholic Relief Services. Um, they'll be talking about the um, process of organizing and implementing this study. Um, and this information will be helpful to anybody interested in conducting a similar study. They'll give, they'll share their perspectives from the field. So Molly and Philip, are you able to join us right now? Yes. Thanks. Um, and just a reminder, please um, keep your presentation to five minutes just so we can stay on schedule. Thanks very much. Okay. Great. Please. So can we see the slide? Everything good, Maui? Yeah, can you please uh, go to the slide? Oh, I see, my screen's not shared. Can you see it now? Yeah. 
Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so for this study, we have to choose two sites in two different regions. Uh, that is uh, two different districts, actually. We did this in part of the northern region and the upper east region. For northern, we did it in the Tolong district. And in upper east, we did it in the Talent Sea uh, district, for which we respectively chose the Yipeligu and Aradoni communities. This was um, to enable us be able to have sufficient resources in terms of personnel and uh, relationship with uh, other actors on the ground. So we chose districts that had current or previous CRS activities running. And then we also uh, chose districts that had, had some level of nutrition related activity implemented for the purpose of continuity and to build on the successes of uh, previous actions related to nutrition. So we also chose districts that had a health post or clinic to facilitate easy access to the lactating mothers and uh, support from the health workers who we needed to help screen and identify lactating mothers and their children. We worked in the two regions also to allow us to be able to assess um, behavior evaluation between two different ethnic groups. And for this also, we had to seek the approval of the ethics committee of the uh, Ghana Health Service, which Dr. Maglo facilitated. Pass. I now move on to talk about the uh, enumerator selection. For this, we had to um, design information communication material in, the, in two different languages, the Dagbanli and um, uh, the Gruni for the Upper East location. We also had eight enumerators trained who had to take the city certification examination to be able to uh, enumerate using um, human subjects. The training was conducted by Dr. Maglo in Tamale, and we had the enumerators to go through the full concept and the methodology, and also to be able to translate um, the enumeration to into the various languages. Uh, we had district and community stakeholders uh, informed in terms of the Ghana service authorities are the two different districts. We also had the district assemblies informed to be aware of what we're doing. Um, so, the, and also the community, uh, traditional authority, and other opinion leaders who mattered in terms of allowing uh, the process to go on smoothly, but also to facilitate the mobilization of the mother and ch children, baby pairs. So we had uh, posters made in English and in the local languages uh, produced and posted at the health centers and in vantage points in the various communities uh, to support with the recruitment of the mothers. Pass. So at this point, um, I would like to have uh, Philip uh, present to you how we went about the participant selection. Philip, Philip, you, your voice is very faint. Can you move closer to the microphone? Okay. Okay, sounds uh, great. Yes, hello everyone. So I'm going to continue with the participant selection. So what we did here was to uh, go to the health centers, meet with the district health directors to inform them about uh, the activity. We shared the posters with them and uh, they gave the go ahead. And when we got to the health centers, we got uh, health staff who supported, identify and register uh, the number of mothers and caregivers that we wanted. So in each district, there were 60 mother infant pairs that we selected and uh, we broke 
we divided this into four groups according to the various uh, recipes that we were supposed to, to, to facilitate the women with. The feasibility group prepared and fed their kids on all the four recipes, whilst the acceptability group were given ration to send, to take home, to prepare, and then be evaluated or tested at home. We made sure we duly registered all participants just to ensure that uh, every day we call out the register to be sure that every registered participant attends uh, actively on each day. Uh, both categories were coached jointly on the survey purpose and the process of how their roles are supposed to be uh, in the activity first. Now the survey session proper. Uh, when the survey was started, we made sure we had a good community entry where we sensitized the chiefs and elders of the two communities and they accepted what we were supposed to do. Uh, the survey grounds were selected. We made sure uh, for communities that were a cluster, it was a vantage point that all of them could come. Uh, survey was set and the groupings of enumerators and the allocation of cooking utensils and please were given to all the groups that were supposed to cook a particular recipe. The nursing mothers were divided into two categories. That is the acceptability and feasibility and all the ingredients were allocated. So for the four groups, 20 to 30 nursing mothers were set up and then we had two, each of the enumerators that were trained, assigned to them to support them, prepare and feed their kids with the recipes uh, in rotation. So at the end, every group got to prepare uh, each of the recipes and fed their kids. The focus, a focus group discussion were also employed to resource uh, with the interviewers and then voice recorders were also used to gather more data uh, for further analysis. Pass. So how did we collect all the data that uh, we intended to? So the different formulations of comfort and the winning mix were weighed, they were served to mothers after they were prepared and then they were fed and time. And then, so the data was collected this way. The, the feeding time for each of the child, the children were, were recorded. The quantity consumed by each child within that time frame was also recorded. And then the remaining food in the plate after the time elapsed was also recorded. Uh, all this, for both the feasibility and acceptability, data was captured digitally on iPhone. Uh, builder software using iPad, which the enumerators used. Uh, this allowed for all team members to have access to the daily data as they were inputted and uploaded. Uh, that is by use of the iPhones. Pass. At the end of the sessions, uh, we had a close-out session in each of the communities where we got the health workers, the community leaders, and all the mothers assembled. Uh, we all, the, some of them gave their remarks on the process. The community leaders and stakeholders were all duly acknowledged for their support throughout the registration and then the sessions proper. After that, mothers were presented with hampers. Uh, these included rice, oil, mackerel, tomato, for their time and their participation in the exercise. First, so with challenges, uh, what we had to share here is that 
we observed that there were some difficulties in uh, the coordinating coordination of how logistics were put together, how ingredients were were purchased because two different uh, bodies were involved in this, and uh, it involved a lot of um, transfers and reallocations, which we thought that uh, in future, if uh, all this could be given directly to those organizations to handle specific activities, then all logistics, it would have been much better. Also, we noticed difficulty in understanding the quality and units in which some ingredients had to be procured and level of processing required. Uh, for example, with the maize, how it's supposed to be dry, uh, fried, dried, grinded, in which form it should be grinded, which texture it should, the grinding should be, all those things were a little bit of challenges uh, that we had to go through. Uh, initially, also in the communities, we had challenges of mothers showing uh, low cooperation uh, in the first few days because they thought the time frame was too long in each day. And it usually started in the mornings when they had a lot of household friends fetching water, feeding, feeding for their kids. So we were we are thinking that in future uh, we could always shift this towards the afternoon when women or mothers would have finished all their daily or morning choices, uh, household choices. Then they can be free to participate fully. Uh, these were the few challenges that we encountered. Pass. All right, so we are done here. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Philip and Maui. And to our audience, um, we'll have time for questions and comments at the very end of this webinar. So please be sure to send in your questions or comments right now via the chat pane. Okay. Um, so now um, we're going to show you some video footage from the study um, and then we'll go to our third poll and then we'll wrap up with a presentation from Dr. Juan Andrade. Um, so here we go with the video footage.
Okay, thank you everybody for watching. Um, that video is posted on the SIL website as well as our YouTube channel um, if you're interested in watching that again. Okay, I'm going to launch our third poll now. You have one minute to respond. Okay, we have 10 seconds left for the poll, so I'll be closing it. Here are the results of the poll. Um, thank you to everybody for responding, and what we can discuss the challenges that you're facing with complementary feeding and early childhood nutrition at the end of this webinar. Finally, we're going to go to Dr. Juan Andrade, who will talk about the relevance of acceptability and feasibility trials, um, as well as providing some more insights about the study results that we conducted. Juan, are you ready to go? Yes, thank you, Maggie. Okay. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Okay, you can move to the next slide, thank you. So good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I just want to make three points before I show a couple of slides of data on feasibility. As, um, as Francis mentioned, uh, doing this type of studies uh, are needed just to enhance the ability of adoption of these type of new products. And as you can see in the poll, cost is a big, big, uh, big factor. But one thing I want to make clear is that these uh, complementary foods are there to complement breast uh, breast milk and that's exclusive uh, breastfeeding for six months and bringing this good nutrition in this time of transition into table foods or family foods so these type of foods are not uh, not the same as family foods and that's why it required uh, very in, uh, key attention so next slide uh, maggie so uh, the who has put together some guidelines about how to how to uh, guide us and, and putting these uh, complementary foods together. And it's not just about nutrition. Uh, food should be adequate in terms of nutrition and uh, consistency, rheology is a semi-solid, semi-fluid. And uh, if its palatability is key, as, as Francis mentioned, the children should eat it and a little bit of sugar helps. Um, it, but besides that, has, they have to be context specific in terms of culture, these are foods for uh, Northern Ghana might be different, in Southern Ghana might be different, a different country. And seasonality is a big problem sometimes in areas in which you don't have orange flesh, sweet potatoes year long, or soybeans. So those are considerations should be included into the design of these foods. As well as uh, time of introduction, we want to uh, push for exclusive breastfeeding for six months and then start bringing these foods uh, uh, with uh, complement the calorie needs of these children and have to be frequently consumed as the child demands that. Um, and they should be, of course, very safe. These are uh, times in which the kids can be prone to more vulnerable to diarrhea. So you have to be free of physical, uh, chemical and biological harm to the children. Next slide, um, Maggie. So when we talk about uh, complementary foods, we're talking about foods that will depend on different factors for uh, their choosing. So uh, food choices the, uh, or food choices depend on many factors and cost, as that the poll was telling us, um, is very important. But it's also taste and the variety of foods you have available, uh, your uh, perceptions of, of health and well-being and the cultural and personal beliefs and, of course, convenience. And, and time of making these foods is very important as, as women also have to work 
uh, and, and do other uh, activities in the household. So when we design these sensory uh, acceptability studies and feasibility studies, is with the with intention to obtain uh, some uh, some information as to uh, how these uh, foods can be prepared at homes and what factors can modulate their adoption beyond cost, because cost is very important, but maybe taste is also important uh, for these uh, families to adopt these technologies and new products. Um, so based on that, we designed this feasibility study. Go to the next slide, Maggie, please. So in this study, and, and some of these uh, was mentioned by Mauli from CRS, it, it was a significant undertake to bring all these women together in different regions in Northern Ghana. But we had a population of about 20 women per groups that uh, from these uh, two communities to help us test these products at their homes. So we, we trained them how to prepare the foods. So we, uh, follow up uh, the next day to see how the, the food preparation was going. We gave all the foods, the foods were for free uh, with all the ingredients and, and we'll tell them how to, to put them together, how to, to mix them, how to know that the foods were done for, and ready for consumption. After that, we replenished the food supplies for seven after seven days. And after uh, 14 days, we conducted the focus groups. And these were focus groups in which we asked several questions to understand uh, the food preparation, and then other aspects of food preparation, such as do you add other ingredients? Do you add salt? Uh, how long it took you to prepare? How do you know it was longer than the time we allocate for uh, for making these foods? And that's that nuance is very important when you want to consider adopting these foods in a household because different families prepare foods differently. And this focus group lasted for uh, one hour. Uh, next slide, please. So here I just uh, want to, I'm going to show you two pieces of information and most of the, the data is published in this report. You can find it in our website online. But uh, one of the things we want to be certain is that it was easy to prepare. Can they prepare foods, uh, these uh, project foods similarly than other complementary foods available to them, most, most of which are based on, on maize? And uh, for the most part, uh, most of our respondents uh, told us that uh, the, the great majority said that these foods were either slightly easy or extremely easy to prepare, and there were no difference uh, among groups. And we compared to Winnie Mix because Winnie Mix, although it's been promoted uh, for the for many years in, in Ghana, uh, is, uh, is also not uh, as prevalent as you might think. So there are other complementary foods available, as I mentioned, uh, mostly maize, uh, porridges. Uh, next slide, please. And then we asked uh, the mothers to tell us if um, how was the perception of ease of consumption by their children. And um, by far, many many of them told us that uh, making these uh, project foods was very easy uh, to consume by their children. And that in, uh, again includes Winnie Mix. So and there's no difference among groups. It was clear that these foods were easy to prepare and they were easy to feed to their children. And there's no complications of making. There are uh, many other comments uh, from this study, again, that will be uh, are written in the report. And next slide. So, and, and this is um, just to bring up some of the nuance that we obtained from this uh, survey. Uh, Mighty percent of the participants will recommend this new complementary approach to their families, some of which said that they might not uh, do it because of this Trump flavor of moringa leaf powder or anchovies, and that's okay uh, because we we kind of find the same information from the acceptability study where moringa leaves and 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 formulations with moringa and with uh, anchovies were less preferred by uh, the 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 kids. Um, some other uh, woman from the groups uh, mentioned that they were recommended because of the ingredients are easy, available, and, and simple uh, to use. Uh, they also mentioned about the uh, nutri uh, value, uh, nutritious value of soybeans, which is important because there had to be a level of perception and attitude toward these staples that should be there in households because that will facilitate the education of them when you want to adopt these, these type of new products. And then some other folks mentioned that these type of products could help alleviate poverty, which is at the end one of the, 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 the goals of these projects that these, through these foods, you uh, provide the good nutrition in hopes that uh, um, other programs can help us alleviate poverty too. Next slide. I think that's the end of this part of the presentation. Should I continue, Maggie? 
Yes, please do. Okay, so so what? Just to finish and to open for a conversation, and I want to go very quickly. Next slide. Uh, so we at a Seal, the nutrition team, we are open for business, and we realize that this model of using Comfa, just an example of uh, a very very interesting good product that can be a game changing in, in in bringing good nutrition to households, but it's, it's not just about nutrition. We think that we can help our partners to uh, address some of the limitations for adoption of these foods through needs assessments and, and understanding the context of this consumption. Of course, nutrient and food analysis are important and we'd like to support our partners in different laboratories to conduct uh, uh, studies uh, to figure it out, to understand the nutrient composition of these foods through the databases available or through collaboration with Illinois, or through support to your universities. And of course, sensory studies are key. Uh, uh, the, the nutrients uh, will have an effect uh, uh, on, only if they are consumed. And that means that we have to invest some time in understanding uh, sensory acceptability of these products. Uh, this feasibility and cost analysis are, are very important, as you can tell from the poll. They have to be, uh, um, they have to be low cost, but not at the expense of nutrition. And that's hard to do when you have very limited variety of foods. That's why through these projects, through USAID Feed the Future projects, our promotion of orange flesh sweet potatoes allow us to combine the, the, the goodness of orange flesh sweet potatoes as well as the goodness of soy, which brings uh, together uh, a very low cost alternative for complementary feeding. And last, we, we want to know what you have done or what you are doing, and we want to share it uh, with, with the whole world. And in, through these collaborations, we want to uh, build these uh, databases and, and, and not just to stay in one uh, shared drive, but just also to share it and to apply it directly, not just to stay in a study, you not know, translate it into applications that are ready, ready uh, to use uh, simply by our um, uh, developer uh, communities in, in, in the field. So with that, I'll, I'll just stop here and I would like to hear your questions and the whole group is ready to, to answer. So thank you very much. Thank you, Juan. And uh, we're going to have Dr. Peter Goldsmith moderate the question session now. Um, he's been collecting the questions that you've been sending in through your chat panels. Um, and so um, I'll defer to Peter now and to um, our presenters, please, uh, make sure you keep your responses short so that we can get to as many questions as possible. Peter, are you ready? I, I am. Can you hear me okay, Max? Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, great, great. Um, so yeah, I'd ask the the um, respondents to uh, responders to keep to keep your answers uh, briefly. We have a number of questions, really good questions. Um, one of the first questions. Um, comes from uh, uh, Daniel Amankwa of Sight and Life on the Abasima project in Accra. Uh, Daniel asks about what steps are being taken to commercialize the product. Uh, I don't know, maybe uh, Francis? Yeah. Pete, should I answer or we'll take all the questions? No, you answer, that would be good. Okay, thank you, Pete. Thanks, Frank. Yes, it's important we think about commercialization, but it's equally important we know the science is right. What do we want to commercialize? If, to me, we commercialize winning eggs and did not do well for us, because the study by Professor Analytics showed that when you, they gave winning eggs to children, they became anemic. But on the Ghanaian market, that is what is there. So the next stage, as one said, is to collaborate with industry to see how they can take it up. We have produced the science. We've made our expertise available for, for it to be adapted. So that's what is, we are all hoping for. We're trying to see how we can get industry to take it up. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Francis. I appreciate that. Um, next question comes from uh, uh, Michael Martin, who's the uh, Instapro Africa sales director. Uh, Michael's asking, how was the uh, Weenimix process 
and what type of soy flour was used in the compa? Okay. So Winemix was processed using the recipe in the as it was designed. The, I mean, if we check Professor Nalate's publications in the 90s, you see how it was prepared. And then for the soil, what we did was we just gave, we bought the soil, the whole roasted it. Uh, sorry, we roasted and the whole and then mill it into flour. That's what we used. Thank you. And uh, a, uh, another uh, a question that comes up is, uh, uh, I'll go back to Daniel because it's, uh, it's, it's relevant to his commercialization uh, uh, question, was about the packaging. What you're thinking about the packaging will be single served. Um, what are your thoughts as you, you've done feasibility work? Thank you. Again, I'm Angwa for the question. You know, in Ghana, if you take Cerulac, for example, when we were growing up, we realized Cerulac was in the big container. But now, what we see is Cerulac has been packaged in the sachet form. And I think it's easier to go that way. Let's not forget, the comfort we're talking about is it contains our moisture. So it's a liquid-based complementary food. So the target we we are we hoping to get if we're going to use if we want to package that type of complementary food in Ghana it will be expensive it will involve the glass or a high the plastic should be in such a way that it will be able to withstand microbial contamination on shelf so what we're doing now is how can we then change it to a dry based complementary food and the recipe is there we can use roller dryer to produce it like Cerelac. So if we get it to that form with an industry, I will recommend the package in such a way like how they sell the 50 gram sachet of Cerelac. I think that will reach more communities. A mother can easily buy one than buying the whole box. So that's what we're looking at. We, we are just scratching the surface of what we can do. So. We have so many ways and we want to welcome everyone on board to join SIL and everyone involved in improving nutrition to see how we can upscale this product to make it better, make nutrition cheap, good nutrition cheap for all. Thank you very much. So, so Pete, just to add to that, uh, to answer, um, to help answer the question as well, I think one of the, the, the keys are the goals of these complementary foods uh, there's two goals, I guess, twofold. One is to those households that can plant the orange flesh sweet potatoes in their backyards, and then they can buy the, the soy uh, and grind and grind it and make these products at home. And of course, as, as it was uh, suggested, that maybe there is some opportunities for uh, uh, companies, uh, uh, low or, or middle-sized companies to dry it, because there's a significant amount of water, of course, in orange flesh sweet potatoes. But in that way, you can, um, potentially kill it up to a larger population as well, folks that can afford a product that is packaged maybe in a plastic bag or in a box. And there is there is uh, already some data on this that uh, Dr. Amaglo has that, that can uh, move us faster in that direction if that's uh, the way to go as well. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Yeah, thank you, Juan. We had a, a, a good question from uh, Agnes Mongongela at uh, Luinar in, uh, in Malawi. She raises a question about uh, mothers and their time. Uh, and I, I, she's asking about special preparation and how uh, preparation of the comfa or a complementary food fits into uh, a mother's uh, meal preparation work schedule. So I don't know if anyone uh, wants to respond to that. And just as a note, sorry to, it's top of the hour and we're able to roll over. So, so if you need to drop off, do, but we'll take a few more questions and probably have a hard stop at 10 after the hour. Okay, I will attempt and one will also help. The data we presented here on comfort shows that it takes a shorter time to cook than the winemaker. And 
I really know that mothers prepare complement, especially those in the, the rural communities. They will prepare complementary food for their babies. And what we are bringing on board actually is reducing the time involved. So if you can grow orange fresh sweet potato in your backyard, all that you need to do is to pick the OFSP, the roots, you wash, you peel, you dye, then you put it on for, and it's ready for cooking. The only ingredient you have to prepare further is the soil. You have to dry, roast, and the whole and meal. But if you compare them, I mean, the comfort formulation to the cereal-based complementary food, you tend to uh, spend a lot of time getting it ready for baby food and the comfort. We know for working mothers, who can? That's why we're thinking about the industrial level. But they have to be prepared to pay for the cost of drying it and making it ready to be eaten. So, so I think that that's a key question. And, how, and through the feasibility studies, it was something that uh, was brought up that uh, uh, it takes, uh, it's easy to prepare. The issue of time is key and how we can reduce the time of women uh, preparing foods not at the expense of good nutrition and care practices for the children. And, and, and of the family dynamics, but to the to, to the point that they can devote the time in other very productive activities, including their own education. So I think that uh, we can do that through foods that are uh, convenient to prepare at homes. And and some of the uh, characteristics of comfa uh, makes makes it very very simple to prepare. And that doesn't mean that you don't have to peel. It doesn't mean that you don't have to roast. What it means is that. When you're boiling less amounts of water, um, uh, which it takes um, lesser time uh, to, to get to the boiling point and then to prepare this food before you can give it to your children, that's a significant savings in fuel and that's a significant savings in time. So I think uh, and we, we didn't do as, as, as more detailed uh, questioning in terms of that specific aspect of time resource. Um, uh, and time it ourselves, right? To have somebody with a with a uh, a watch timing this uh, woman preparing foods at home because they were on their own doing this, but it was a, a comment from some of the women that that was that was the case. So I I think there's that's why we mentioned that there's some uh, more opportunities for more detailed type of studies in which we ask those type of questions that for us are very important. But we have some ideas that this might be the case. Thanks, Juan. Um, a couple of questions, and maybe you've touched on a little bit, but maybe summarize about the availability of the ingredients locally. Um, and as that's an important component of any um, uh, prepared uh, at home complementary food. Uh, in, the, in, in terms of uh, the, the comfa versus maybe other complementary foods, talk about the availability in Northern Ghana for the ingredients and the relative costs. Thank you very much, Juan. Pete, sir. Yeah, for availability, every food you have to eat, you have to acquire the ingredient. For the OFSP, through you said funding, for example, the Resiliency in Northern Ghana project, they are meeting large numbers of households in northern Ghana. I know in Volta region, there's a drive for them to go into production of the orange flesh sweet potato. It's simply just like maize. If you don't grow it, you will not get it. The other challenging thing about the OFSP is how you can store because maize stores better than the OFSP. So how do we make sure that we have the ingredients available all year round? If we want to do it, we can have a store for a year, but it involves another business where you have a group doing the off-season storage because you need to control humidity and then temperature. And you can store for more than a year if you control humidity and temperature. But there's initial capital investment that is required. So our suggestion is as they grow maize, during the time they grow, at least we can keep the OFSP for two months. So if nothing happens at all, whilst you grow your maize, 
grow the OFSP, you can intercrop it with maize and feed your child two months in a year for us in the north. But down south where they have two types of raining season, it means you can have four months in a year on the OFSP whilst we wait for big businesses to come and get it produced all around. So basically, it's, if we need to, we want it, we have a way of doing just like all the other ingredients you can buy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Francis. Yeah, I, there's quick question was about the recordings of the webinar will be available. Yes, they will. They'll be placed on, on the website. And uh, so that'll be available. Another question was about um, that comes from um, uh, uh, Marianne Zeni. Hopefully I've said that correctly, Marianne, from Save the Children. She asked about hygienic practices. Um, was that involved in the training? Is that uh, an important point? Where are some critical control points in terms of uh, hygiene with respect to complementary foods in general, but also the COMPA? One, will you address that one, or she go? Yes. Yeah, so, so um, this a, a excellent question, and there's I, I'm looking at the other questions in this uh, panel, and and uh, they seem to to ask similar um, uh, similar questions. Uh, with with safety, we did not touch safety in this study, at least with the acceptability um, a part of it. But we did uh, when we prepare the foods in the in these different uh, regions. We use the fuels and the pots and the water available to us. This was not water brought up. Um, uh, we use all of these materials and went through the boiling of the uh, of these uh, complementary foods. Uh, the expectation that these foods are safe to consume, and they are. The but when you and somebody mentioned about education and certainly somebody is asking about how we can move it forward and i think you move it forward by by bringing those um, the evidence that we have here into a larger community of practitioners and this is uh, a starting point through this webinar and i think the 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 components of safety the components of nutrition education the components of this behavior change to start using the sweet potato uh, through these other programs that Francis mentioned, USA defunded. Uh, th that's, those are ways to promote this uh, utilization and, and awareness of these other staples that are useful to bring good nutrition to the household. And it's just not in the vacuum of just nutrition or in the vacuum of healthcare or in the vacuum of or, or the silo of, um, of, of agricultural practices. But those, those are very important questions that when we bring this and scale it up, that all those details are included in these in these programs as safe hygiene uh, and and food preparation behavior change and we are gearing up into that direction but then we need the partners to help us at uh, moving this product uh, there. Thank you. Thanks, Juan. Um, uh, David Albin of Instapro uh, asks a, a, a really good question about institutional and large-scale procurement for complementary food programs about, for example, the World Food Program and the ability uh, to get involved in complementary foods that maybe move beyond corn and soy blend. Uh, maybe you guys uh, respond to, to David's question. The question again, please. Yeah. So David is asking about the larger scale, more institutional uh, level uh, programs involving complementary foods, for example, involving the World Food Program uh, mm -hmm. and moving uh, corn soy blend, which is a, a, a common uh, food. Um, would they move into or could they or what are the challenges associated? with moving into maybe higher quality, more functional, more locally procured, for example, uh, uh, complementary foods such as comfa or, or other foods? That, that's a very good question. And to me, I don't, I'm, I'm, we are not in the best position to answer. We have 
the as scientists, we have produced a science. Winnemix was a science. They, at that time, it solved an issue of protein energy malnutrition. But what we've realized is, it, unfortunately, those, those ingredients they mixed led to high incidence of anemia and all those things based on an profanalytic study. So we've made the science available. Comfa is available. The recipe is there through our reports, through earlier publications. We, we are talking to, I know we've, we've approached UNICEF on one occasion, but I don't know if as an organization, they will take it up. But we are ready still one, myself, and all others also working. I know CIP is working with orange flesh, sweet potato. We are there. So it depends on our willingness to take it up. But for the big guys to accept, we need to let them know. And I think one of us are meeting now is it's also going to help. That is being circulated. And this is something they can do at the household level. So we are all praying to see what will happen. But as I said, our expertise are available for everyone to use. Thank you. So, so just to compliment, yeah. Um, yeah. I think, I think the, the, this is a very key question and, and it's always about scaling up. But when we scale up, we tend to, um, to limit the availability of these products for those that we were designed for, which is a very bottom of the market. However, the, the, the ability of the food industry within different countries in which they have a tremendous uh, uh, now equipment to, to dry these materials, and, and there's something that uh, Francis and uh, Dr. Amaglo is working on, how we can make this a, a instant porridge type food with these ingredients and potentially adding uh, micronutrients just in case we want to enhance the uh, availability of specific or key vitamins and minerals. Those are type of things that I, I feel the food industry can help us and, and design the best strategies to bring this product in, not just in the right form to so just add water or just very small amounts of, of time and, and fuel, but also uh, the packaging and the delivery and the, the, the uh, the market availability of these products through other channels that are not just your backyard or your regular grocery store, but to many more folks. So, so demand can, can start uh, increasing and, and, and pushing now more folks trying to grow orange flesh sweet potatoes in, in Ghana and, and soy, of course. So, so I think those are very quick key questions, but we need those partners, those companies that want to, to take that challenge. Thank you, Juan. Thank you, Francis. Hey, we need to, everyone's got schedules and it needs to be places. Um, so we'll stop the um, taking questions right now. Um, the, uh, we will uh, answer all the questions and certainly allow offline uh, exchanges and so forth uh, to carry on the discussion. But let me turn it back now to uh, Maggie Cornelius, our moderator. Thanks everyone. Yes, thank you, Peter, Juan, and Francis, Molly, and Philip for presenting today, and thanks to everybody for attending. Um, this webinar has been recorded, so we'll circulate it to everybody who registered for this webinar and also post it on our website. Um, again, we'll circulate the report about the study that we conducted in northern Ghana. Um, and then we also have created a survey that we're going to ask all webinar participants to fill out so we can learn more about your work with early childhood nutrition um, and learn more about the needs of the development sector so that SIL can um, design new investigations to provide evidence for your future programming. Um, and then we also will circulate the recipes um, for the COMFA complementary food um, in the follow-up email. And then anybody whose question was not responded to during this Q&A session will respond to you individually um, via email. So uh, don't forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Send any other further questions to Soybean Innovation Lab that Illinois, oh, sorry, Soybean Innovation Lab um, at illinois.edu. Um, 
and we look forward to uh, seeing you again at future webinars. Thanks. Goodbye.